Hello, my name is Cameron Burin. The topic for today's presentation is video head impulse testing or VHEAD. After a brief overview, we will talk about the pathophysiology of VHEAD. Then we will review what test parameters are measured and calculated. After that, we will go over the interpretation of the test, the impact of artifacts, and the clinical value of the test. The head impulse test was first described as a bedside test of the vestibular ocular reflex, or VOR. In the bedside test, the patient is asked to fixate on a stationary target. Then the head is rapidly moved to the right and left while monitoring the eye movements. The head can be moved in the plane of anterior and posterior canals, which allows examination of all three semicircular canal pairs. The video head impulse test, or VHIT, was developed to address some of the shortcomings of the bedside test and to provide a quantitative assessment of the VOR. Today, VHIT has become an important part of the vestibular test battery for patients with dizziness and other balance problems. In the bedside test, the head is moved using small amplitude, high velocity, high acceleration, unexpected head movements as the patient is fixating on a stationary target straight ahead. That's usually the examiner's nose. As you know, in other tests of vestibular function, such as the caloric test or the rotation chair test, we usually have to remove fixation by testing the patient in complete darkness or with uh, eyes closed. In VHIT, both the oculomotor and vestibular pathways are involved. In order to reduce the contribution of the oculomotor pathways, we must use head velocities where the smooth pursuit pathways are no longer operational. For lateral head impulses, that's about 100 degrees per second or greater, and for vertical head impulses, that's about 50 degrees per second or greater. In normal subjects, the VOR generates uh, compensatory eye movements by moving the eyes in the opposite direction of the head movements with approximately with the same velocity. In effect, this allows the eyes to remain stationary in space. Here is an, uh, a video of normal eye movements during VHIT. As you can see, the eye movements are smooth with no extraneous jumps. In patients with unilateral vestibular lesion, when the head is moved toward the damaged side, the eyes fall short of the target. As a consequence, the patient must make quick saccades to return the eyes back to the target. The saccades that occur after the head comes to a stop are called overt saccades because they are visible to the naked eye. Here's an example of a patient with overt saccades. As you can see, when the head is moved to the right, the eyes fall short and the patient makes a saccade that's visible to the naked eye. Some patients learn to initiate the saccade during head movements. The saccades that occur during head movements are not visible to the naked eye during the bedside testing. They are called covert saccades. Here's what we see in a patient with a covert saccade. As you can see, the test can be considered unremarkable because we don't see any saccades. But if we play the test, in slow motion or frame by frame, then you can see the saccade right there. Let's pl play that one more time. Right there, that was where the saccade was.
The bedside test is a useful clinical tool in some cases, but obviously it has a major limitation because it misses covert saccades. In the 1990s, scleral search coils were used for identifying the covert saccades and quantifying the head impulse test. But that method is not practical for routine clinical testing. Around the year 2010, the video version of the head impulse test became avail available commercially. In VHIT, eye movements are recorded and analyzed by high-speed cameras, and the head movements are measured by motion sensors embedded in the goggles. The device can monitor the clinician's ability to deliver appropriate head impulses and provide feedback to improve the performance. Now let's discuss the test procedures. Technically, for head impulses, the head should be turned downward about 30 degrees to place the lateral canals in the horizontal plane. In practice, it's better to do the test with the head upright because the differences are minimal and in the upright position, the eyes are in the better position for recording. Here's the video of lateral head impulses. In the lateral test, we look for eye movements and catch-up saccades in the horizontal plane. For vertical head impulses, the test can be performed in the plane of right anterior, left posterior canals, that's RALP, or in the plane of left anterior, right posterior canals, and that's LARP. For vertical head impulses, different manufacturers recommend different methods. In here, only the movements for LARP are considered, but the test is very similar for RALP. In the first method, used by ICCAM, the head starts straight and moves left downward to right upward, with the target placed straight ahead. As, vid as the video shows, only the canals in blue, that's left anterior and right posterior canals, are in the plane of motion and they are the only ones stimulated. In the second method, used by ICS Impulse and others, the head is turned 45 degrees right and moved downward or upward with the target placed straight ahead. Again, only the, anterior, the left anterior and right posterior canals are stimulated. There's a great deal of discussion about which method is correct and which one is preferable. Method 1 generates both torsional and vertical eye movements, but the gaze direction remains aligned with the primary gaze direction throughout the test. The software separates and measures the vertical component of the head movement and compares it with the vertical component of eye movement. In Method 2, only vertical eye movements are generated and the head movements are also limited to the vertical plane. In this method, the gaze direction is about 45 degrees with respect to the primary gaze direction, which could potentially cause pupil detection issues. The main reason for choosing method two is to avoid generating torsional eye movements and comparing the vertical eye and head positions directly. The question is, does the torsional component of eye movements cause inaccuracies in the measurement of vertical eye movements. The paper from 2011 compared method 2, which they labeled as the 2D modified hit, with method 1, which they called the traditional 3D hit. They used the scleral search coils for this comparison. The conclusion was that method 2 was less noisy and generated more accurate VOR gains. The source of the noise was attributed to the coils hitting the eyelids during torsional eye movements. They are depicted here with those red arrows. But as you might guess, that is not an issue with VHIT. So both methods should be acceptable. In fact, a 2020 paper 
compared the methods in normal individuals and patients with bilateral vestibular loss and found both methods were able to differentiate the groups with high level of sensitivity and specificity. So the conclusion here is that just follow the manufacturer's recommendations when you do in vertical head impulses. You should be able to get acceptable results. Now let's discuss pathophysiology of video head impulse testing. Let's isolate one of the semicircular canals, in this case the right lateral canal, and look at its neural activity during head impulses. When the head is at rest, there's a spontaneous neural activity of about 80 to 100 spikes per second, which matches the spontaneous activity of the paired canal on the left. There's an inherent asymmetry between excitatory and inhibitory responses of the canals. For, excit for excitation, the neural activity can go as high as 400 spikes per second. But for inhibitory responses, the neural activity can go only down to zero. When a head impulse is performed in the plane of one of the semicircular canals toward that canal, it generates excitatory responses. For head impulses, the change in the neural firing is a replica of the head velocity which means you can connect the afferent nerve from this canal directly to the extraocular muscles and get compensatory eye movements without any intervention from the higher levels of the brain. On the other hand, the head impulses away from the designated canal. If the head velocity is high enough, it's likely that the neural firing will saturate and clip at zero spikes per second. That means the neural activity is no longer providing an accurate measure of the head velocity. This asymmetry can be a problem, but fortunately in a normal individual, there's always one of the paired canals in the excitatory mode, while at the same time, the other canal is in the inhibitory mode. For natural head movements, those are head movements that are... Uh, within the velocities of about 100 degrees per second. Changes in the neural firings are proportional to the head velocity, but in opposite directions. Let's flip them so that the head and eye velocities are shown in the same direction. The signal to the oculomotor system is the difference between the right and left neural responses. The ORI movements have a very short latency because, as mentioned before, they're mediated by the brainstem without higher level brain involvement. The head and eye movements are about the same, and the, eye, and the VOR gain is approximately equal to 1. For higher velocities of head impulses, the inhibitory responses saturate quickly but the excitatory responses remain proportional to the head velocity. During the saturation, which is the gray area of the left vestibular nerve, responses to head impulses are mediated primarily by one of the semicircular canals. But remember, that's a very small part of the head impulse. Despite the asymmetry between excitatory and inhibitory responses, the resulting eye movements remain symmetrical for right-left impulses. The VOR gain is still close to 1, but will decrease slightly with increasing head velocity. In this example, we assume that the excitatory and inhibitory responses are weighed equally. But we know from Ewald's second and third laws that the excitatory responses are stronger than the inhibitory responses. What that means is that the excitatory responses are weighed um, more heavily, uh, for example, in this case, three times more than the inhibitory responses. This has the effect of reducing the effect of saturation and providing more accurate compensatory eye movements.
In patients with a unilateral loss of function, when the, hem, when the head impulses are toward the side of lesion, the neural responses from the damaged side is uh, reduced or abolished, as you can see in the dotted line here. So the pulse that was supposed to be here is missing. The neural response from the intact side is saturated and no longer proportional to head velocity. That means the resulting eye velocity does not match the head velocity and the eyes fall short of the target. The VOR gain is much smaller than 1 and decreases rapidly with increasing head velocity. There is a misconception that the head impulses toward the intact semicircular canal generate neural, normal responses. That's in fact not true. For a head impulses away from the side of lesion, the neural response from the intact side is proportional to the head velocity. But the neural response from the damaged side is again reduced or abolished, as it's shown here with the dotted red line again. As a result, the eyes fall somewhat short of the target. The VOR gain is still less than 1 and decreases with increasing head velocity, but the gain is not as low as the VOR gain for head impulses toward the side of lesion. It also doesn't decrease as rapidly. If we look at the shape of the eye movements, we can see that for head impulses toward the side of lesion, the shape of the VOR eye movements in high velocity head impulses is related to the severity of the loss. In severe losses, for high velocity impulses, the VOR eye movements will be clipped or saturated. For less severe losses, the clipping will not be as noticeable. In VHIT, we instruct the patients to keep their eyes on the target. If VOR eye movements are not adequate to put the eyes on the target, then the oculomotor pathways will be activated. In particular, the saccadic mechanism will attempt to move the eyes to the target. So if at the end of the head movement, if there is a difference between the gaze and target positions, a saccade will be initiated. But because the higher levels of the brain are involved, there's a delay and the eye movement doesn't occur immediately. In fact, in fact, it takes about 80 to 100 milliseconds for the eyes to begin to move. These are overt saccades because the saccade occurs well after the head movement. If we look at the latency from the beginning of the head movement, these saccades have long latency of about 250 milliseconds or more. If the patient can predict that the eyes will fall short of the target, he or she may decide to initiate the saccade before the head comes to a stop. For example, here, as soon as the difference between the head and eye velocities reaches a threshold value, the saccade is initiated. As a result, the saccade may occur during the head movement, which will generate covert saccades. These types of saccades usually have a shorter latency of typically less than 200 milliseconds. One point that should be made is that these short latency saccades do not always occur during head movements, and they can occur very shortly after the end of the head movement. Covert saccades are usually followed by a small overt saccade because the patient cannot predict exactly where the eyes will end up, especially if head impulses are performed unexpectedly. Still, these overt saccades are too small to be detectable without recording. The mechanism for triggering covert saccades is not fully understood, but it must involve some form of predictive or learning behavior. The preliminary reports uh, suggest that covert saccades are associated with compensation. 
That is, patients with covert saccades demonstrate better dynamic visual acuity, improved balance, and reduced symptoms. But these are preliminary results and require more studies. One question is, should we still call these uh, saccades covert saccades? Because in VHIT, they're not really covert. We can record them. It seems more appropriate to consider these saccades as short latency saccades, regardless of whether they occur during or shortly after head movements, because they are initiated by the same mechanism. Now, with the knowledge of pathophysiology, let's examine which patterns of VHIT results can be considered valid ones and which ones are likely to be artifacts. The first pattern is the normal VHIT pattern which is represented by the absence of significant catch-up saccades and VOR gains that are greater than 0.8 bilaterally. A few small catch-up saccades may occur, especially for high-velocity head impulses. Let's remember that normal VHIT does not mean normal vestibular function. In fact, the caloric test and uh, VEMPs may still show patterns consistent with peripheral vestibular abnormalities. The next pattern is the unilateral loss pattern. It's represented by the presence of significant catch-up saccades on one side along with asymmetric gain with the gain usually less than 0.8 for that side. This pattern indicates a unilateral lesion involving the ipsilateral semicircular canal or its branch of the vestibular nerve. Catch-up saccades may also be present for impulses away from the site of lesion, but they are not as large and they usually start at higher head velocities. Initially, most of the catch-up saccades are long latency type, uh, which are referred to as overt saccades. Over time, with learning and prediction, short latency or covert saccades may develop. Covert saccades usually are followed by a small overt saccade, as you can see here. As we talked about it before, in preliminary reports, covert saccades have been associated with compensation. When there is a spontaneous nystagmus or gaze nystagmus, the interpretation of VHIT becomes complicated. That's because fast phases of this nystagmus appear as spikes in eye velocity tracings and can be mistaken for catch-up saccades. But there are crucial differences. Unlike catch-up saccades, spikes for spontaneous nystagmus can occur before or after head impulses. Also, the velocity of spontaneous nystagmus fast phases is usually much smaller than the velocity of catch-up saccades. In acute lesions, fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus will be intermixed with catch-up saccades for impulses toward the side of lesion. But they will be in the opposite direction of typical catch-up saccades for impulses uh, away from the side of lesion. So another valid pattern is for a patient with an acute unilateral lesion. In this case, you have the characteristics of a unilateral loss as discussed earlier, but also fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus that will be intermixed with catch-up saccades. Here the fast phases are shown in red, but in actual test, there is no color coding. You have to distinguish them from the catch-up saccades based on the differences that we discussed. For example, the spikes for spontaneous nystagmus can occur before or after head impulses. And more importantly, fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus will be in the opposite direction of catch-up saccades for impulses away from the site of lesion. Finally, the next valid pattern is the bilateral loss pattern characterized by presence of significant catch-up saccades on both sides along with reduced gain on both sides which are usually less than 0.8. Catch-up saccades can be overt or covert. In case of symmetrical loss, gain asymmetry is expected to be minimal 
But for bilateral uh, losses that are unequal, the VOR gain pattern can be similar to the gain pattern for, gain pattern for unilateral vestibular deficits. As we'll see later, if the sum of the right and left VOR gains is less than one, there has to be a loss on both sides. Speaking of the bilateral loss pattern, a supplemental test called SHIMP, which stands for Suppression Head Impulse Paradigm, may be, helpful, uh, may be a helpful addition to the standard VHIT. In SHIMP, the target is attached to the head and moves with it instead of being stationary. In normal individuals, when the head impulse is performed to one side, the VOR generates compensatory eye movements and keeps the eyes straight ahead. But now the target has moved ahead of gaze and the subject must make a saccade to get to the target. The direction of the saccade is in the opposite direction of typical catch-up saccades. These types of saccades are sometimes called anti-saccades or wrong-way saccades. In patients with bilateral loss of function, the eyes move with the head because there's no VOR and end up on the target. As a result, no catch-up saccade is needed. So here is the SHIMP results for a normal person with bilateral wrong-way saccades. And here's the pattern uh, for a patient with bilateral loss where SHIMPS uh, shows no catch-up saccades. In these, patient, in these patients, SHIMP uh, makes it easier to measure the VOR gain because the responses are not contaminated uh, with catch-up saccades. But in reality, the usefulness of the test, uh, SHIMP, is limited to these patients and it's not uh, particularly helpful in other cases. So now let's discuss how VHIT parameters are measured or calculated. As we discussed, both visual and vestibular mechanisms can contribute to head impulse testing. Before we discuss how VHIT parameters are measured, we have to make sure that the responses are coming from the vestibular system only. For that, the head velocities must exceed a threshold. That threshold is about 100 degrees per second for lateral head impulses. For the maximum limit, we try to stay below 250 to 300 degrees per second for safety reasons. Fortunately, most VHIT systems these days allow you to set the limits beforehand and impulses that are not within the prescribed range will not be accepted. For vertical VHIT, the minimum can be reduced to about 50 degrees per second and the maximum down to about 200 degrees per second. That's because the vertical smooth pursuit system is not as effective and its uh, velocity limits are lower than the horizontal smooth pursuit. Along with the peak impulse velocity, another question about best practices in performing VHIT is how many impulses are needed for interpretation. Earlier recommendations were for performing at least 20 impulses for each direction. That approach is no longer recommended. It turns out that quality is more important than quantity. The current thinking is that you need no more than three to five good impulses for interpretation. Of course, you may need to do more, more than that, so that after tossing out noisy and artifactual tracings, you can still end up with that minimum of three to five. Keeping an eye on the screen as you do the test can help you decide if you're getting enough of good, clean impulses. Currently, VHIT results are quantified by two parameters. First is the VOR gain, which is defined as the ratio of VORs or slow eye movements to head movements. 
A related parameter is the gain asymmetry, which is the difference between right-left VOR gains. The other parameters are related to the properties of the catch-up saccades, namely the peak velocity and latency of these saccades. There are other parameters that we are currently uh, not considering or quantifying, but maybe they sh we should do this in the future. These are the average or sum of right-left VOR gains, cumulative saccade amplitudes, and the VOR I velocity shape. Let's first consider the VOR gain. The VOR gain quantifies the relationship between VOR or slow eye movements and head movements. It's calculated as the ratio of VOR eye movements over the head movements, but there's disagreement about what measures of head and eye movements should be used to calculate the VOR gain. Some systems use instantaneous velocity, others use position, and some use the regression between head between the head and eye velocities. The results may be different depending on which method is used. It's, uh, let's also remember that the interpretation of the VOR gain in VHIT is complicated. Although VOR gains are uh, represented in an, audio, in an audiogram like form, they do not reflect the function of a single canal. They always represent the function of both involved canals. For the instantaneous velocity method, the VOR gain is typically calculated at a fixed interval, usually at 40, 60, or 80 milliseconds after the onset of the head impulse. Depending on the eye velocity shape, values at different intervals may be different. The advantage of this method is that the eye velocities are usually not contaminated by uh, potential covert saccades, as you can see here on the right. The disadvantage is that the instantaneous velocity gain is more susceptible to certain artifacts, such as the slippage of the goggles. The VOR gain can also be calculated by taking the area under the head and VOR eye velocity curves. This gives us the final head and uh, VOR eye positions after the head impulse. For this method, covert saccades must be removed before calculating the area under the curve. The advantage of the position gain is that it is directly related to what causes the catch-up saccades, that is, the difference between eye and head positions. Another advantage is that it's less sensitive to some types of goggle movements. The disadvantage is that one has to first remove the covert saccades, other, otherwise they will affect the gain calculation. Another disadvantage is that it's more sensitive to pupil detection artifacts. In the regression method, the eye and head velocities for the first 100 millisecond of the impulse are considered and the VOR gain is calculated based on the slope of the best fitting line that goes through these points. The advantages and disadvantages of the regression method are similar to the velocity method with the added benefit that the regression gain is more robust and less sensitive to goggle movements. To interpret the catch-up saccades, consider the following items. First, consistency or frequency. That means how many of the impulses produce significant catch-up saccades and at what head velocities. Second, the direction. Are the catch-up saccades in the same direction as the VORI movements or in the opposite direction? Third, uh, the latency or timing. Are they short latency or long latency saccades? And what is the intersaccadic latency? And finally, what's the peak velocity or the amplitude profile?
Abnormal catch-up saccades are the most important sign of a lesion il involving the ipsilateral semicircular canal or its afferent neural pathway. But unfortunately, the criteria for abnormal catch-up saccades are still emerging. So here is an example where there are catch-up saccades for both rightward and leftward head impulses. But you can see that the frequency of the catch-up saccades for the rightward impulses are much higher than the incidence of that for the leftward head impulses. When considering the latency, concentrate on the latency of the first saccade for each head impulse. The value for short latency saccades is usually less than 225 milliseconds and higher than that for long latency saccades. Some systems uh, give you the uh, values and allow you to edit the profiles if something is not right. For example, down here you see how the, ten how the latencies can be made more accurate by editing the onset of the, uh, the catch-up saccade. The measured latencies depend on the saccade algorithm and norms may be specific to each system. Currently, most devices characterize saccades using peak saccade velocities. But this may not be the best measure because the peak saccade velocity is related to the amplitude and duration of saccades, especially when there's more than one saccade during each impulse. So for example, if the duration is large, the peak velocity may be uh, lower. In addition, both uh, the peak velocity and latency are affected by um, filtering that's necessary to condition uh, the eye velocities. So it is uh, conceivable that a different parameter, namely cumulative saccade amplitude, may be a more stable parameter for characterizing the catch-up saccades, but currently it's not being used. Now let's go through the step-by-step -step interp interpretation of VHIT. When interpreting the test, first consider the artifacts and determine if the test is interpretable. Too many artifacts and certain types of artifact may make the test uninterpretable. When trying to identify the artifacts, the important part of this uh, involves separating real fast eye movements from artifactual eye movements. Real fast eye movements can be long latency catch-up saccades, can be short latency catch-up saccades, or they can be fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus. Then there's everything else. When trying to uh, identify saccade types and whether, whether they're real or artifactual, look at the individual impulse tracings. It's hard to determine anything from looking at the results of all impulses at the same place up uh, at the top figure. One example of uh, artifact is when you have two saccades, consecutive saccades, that are going in opposite directions with the intersaccadic latency of about 100 to 80 to 100 millisecond. This means that the patient is actually looking around and not keeping the eye on the target. If, the, if this is frequent, uh, reinstruct the patient. The next examples here are biphasic or uniphasic artifacts due to eye blinks, eyelids obstructing the pupil, uh, or uh, LED light intruding on the pupil. Compare these with the actual saccades about, uh, in the above figure. These apparent movements are too fast and their durations are too small to be actual eye movements. These artifacts are more common when the pupil is large. To improve the situation, you can shine a light uh, 
preferably on the eye that's not being recorded, to shrink the pupil. When performing impulses, pay attention to the display. If you're getting too many artifacts, stop and figure out why. When analyzing the data with artifacts, delete the affected impulses before interpreting the test. Recording the video of eye movements can be helpful in, identif in identifying these types of artifacts. Another type of artifact that's caused by pupil detection issues is high-frequency oscillation of the eye velocity tracings. Again, these are too fast to be real eye movements. You can adjust the cameras, the focus, and the threshold of pupil detection to get improved results. If you have too many, tracing, too many tracings that contain these kinds of high-frequency oscillations, the test may become uninterpretable. If the VOR gain is much higher than 1 or much lower than 1, but there are no catch-up saccades, this usually represents some form of artifact, most likely bad calibrations. If the eye velocity tracing is leading the head velocity tracing, that usually indicates some form of a goggle slippage. Bumping the goggles can also affect both uh, the eye velocity tracing and possibly the head velocity tracing. Once you have taken care of the artifacts, you can proceed with the interpretation. Next, find out if there are abnormal catch-up saccades. Use the guidelines for consistency, direction, timing, and amplitude to determine if they are significant. If there are no significant catch-up saccades, check the VOR gains, and if they are within normal limits, usually close to 1, uh, higher than 0.8, then VHIT should be considered within normal limits. If the VOR gains are not within normal limits, in the absence of abnormal catch-up catch saccades, you should consider the presence of some sort of an artifact. Here is an example where there are no clearly identifiable catch-up saccades. VOR gains are close to one bilaterally, and head velocities are approximately equal for right-left impulses, and they are within the optimal range. There are no other sign of artifacts, and this VHIT should be considered uh, a normal VHIT. I would, delete this, I would delete this one impulse that looks odd just for appearance purposes, but it really doesn't affect anything. So here's a case. There are a few catch-up saccades bilaterally, especially for high-velocity head impulses. The saccade velocities are much smaller compared to the head velocity. So in this case, this most likely represents a normal VHIT. If the saccade amplitudes were higher, one may consider calling these abnormal, even if the VOR gains were not below 0.8. In that case, the result may signify a mild bilateral lesion. The next step in the, interpret in the interpretation is, if there are abnormal catch-up saccades, determine if they are present for head impulses in one direction only or in both directions. If catch-up saccades are present in one direction only and the VOR gain is abnormal for that side, then consider VHIT consistent with a unilateral lesion. For lateral VHIT, Abnormal results indicate a lesion in the ipsilateral lateral canal or its afferent neural pathway, which is the superior portion of the vestibular nerve. For RALP and LARP, abnormal results during downward head movements represent a lesion in the anterior canal or its afferent neural pathway, which is again the superior portion of the vestibular nerve. And abnormal results during upward head movements they represent a lesion in the posterior canal or its afferent neural pathway, which is, the, in this case, is the inferior portion of the vestibular nerve. Significant gain asymmetry 
usually accompanies observation of abnormal catch-up saccades with the lower gain for the side of lesion. In this example, there are catch-up saccades for rightward head impulses, and the VOR gain is asymmetric with significantly lower than normal VOR gain for rightward head impulses. This indicates a unilateral vestibular de deficit on the right. The VOR gains for leftward head impulses are reduced too, although they are within normal range here. But it would not have made a difference even if the, um, this gain was not within normal range. It would not have changed the interpretation. If you look at the LARP and RALP responses of that same patient, you can see that this uh, patient has abnormal uh, findings for the right posterior canal and to a lesser extent for the anterior canal on the same side. That means this is a global right-sided right lesion affecting all three semicircular canals. Next, if abnormal catch-up saccades are present in both directions, determine the shape of the VOR eye velocities for each direction. If VOR eye velocities are clipped or saturated for one direction, but proportional to head velocities in the opposite direction, consider VHIT consistent with the unilateral lesion on the side of the clipped or saturated eye velocity responses. This type of finding is usually accompanied by a significant gain asymmetry with the lower gain for the side of lesion. The interpretation is the same and doesn't matter if the VOR gain for the contralateral side is within normal limits or not. It's important to recognize that cases, in cases like these, we cannot completely rule out uh, pre the uh, presence of bilateral by asymmetric uh, loss of function. If the VORI velocities exhibit clipping or saturation in both directions, then one can be more confident that the VHIT is consistent with the bilateral loss of function involving both um, involved canals or their afferent neural pathways. This finding is usually accomplished by bilateral reduction of gain. So here, uh, we have abnormal uh, catch-up saccades in both directions, but more significant for rightward head impulses. We also have clipped VORI velocities for rightward head impulses and proportional VOR velocities for leftward head, head impulses. So this is likely a right unilateral vestibular deficit as opposed to an, uh, as opposed to an asymmetric bilateral one. The VOR gain for leftward head impulses may be abnormal, but again, the interpretation is the same. Here's an example of a complete bilateral loss. Abnormal catch-up saccades are present bilaterally, and the VOR gain is near zero for both directions. If you remember, we could use SHIMP in this patient for better calculation of the gains, but in this case, it doesn't really seem to uh, add much because the uh, catch-up saccades occur fairly late uh, during the head um, uh, head movement. If we look at the complete test results, the 3D VHIT results for the same patient, it shows more or less across the board bilateral loss, uh, which makes sense. This is a patient uh, who was uh, exposed to vestib vestibular toxic uh, uh, medications. Next, if saccades are present, but they are in the opposite direction of the VOR eye movements, in at least one direction, then consider, pres consider presence of spontaneous nystagmus. The most likely presentation of this type, this, this type of finding is in a patient with an acute peripheral vestibular lesion. So let's look at this example. As you know, fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus appear as spikes in the eye velocity tracings. 
spontaneous nystagmus fast phases can occur before or after head impulses. For typical spontaneous nystagmus that beats away from the site of lesion, spikes appear in the opposite direction of VOR eye movements following head impulses toward the intact site. Uh, fast phases of spontaneous nystagmus are intermixed with the catch-up saccades during head impulses toward the site of lesion. Sometimes displaying a longer time frame and also um, overlapping the eye and head velocities can help with identifying nystagmus fast phases, as you can see in the bottom uh, graph here. How do we go about interpreting the catch-up saccades? First, identify impulses that have artifacts and delete them. Make sure that you account for spontaneous nystagmus by identifying wrong way saccades for impulses toward the intact site. Then identify true catch-up saccades using the latency of the first saccade. Determine significant saccades using the saccade peak velocities. We don't have real good norms, but one suggestion is to use peak saccade velocity of greater than 100 degrees per second as a threshold for abnormal catch-up saccade. Yet another uh, suggestion is to use uh, peak velocities that are at least greater than half of the peak head velocity. Regardless of which method you use, determine how many of the impulses have significant catch-up saccades, significant and abnormal not catch-up saccades. We may have catch-up saccades for both rightward and leftward impulses, but they are more frequent to the side of lesion, and they usually start at lower head velocities. If most of the head impulses produce catch-up saccades uh, that are significant, consider the test abnormal, even if the VOR gain is not in the abnormal range. In some cases, you may have normal VOR gain, but small and consistent catch-up saccades either on one side or both sides. Anecdotally, this might indicate a mild lesion. I think we discussed one of these cases earlier on. But this is uh, not definitive yet and needs more research. To summarize the interpretation steps, in the presence of abnormal catch-up saccades that meet the consistency, direction, timing, and the velocity criteria, VHIT should be considered abnormal regardless of the VOR gain, whether it's normal or abnormal. Conversely, abnormal VOR gains in the absence of catch-up saccades should be investigated further for possible artifacts. Again, let's emphasize that the VOR gain is a complicated parameter that depends on the method of calculation and the underlying test conditions. Finally, head velocities must be within a specific range and right-left uh, velocity profiles must be approximately the same for valid interp interpretation of VHIT. So now let's talk about clinical application of VHIT. One of the most important contributions of VHIT is that for the first time, isolated abnormalities in the vertical canals and their neural pathways can be identified. In abnormalities that involve the vestibular nerve, VHIT can uh, determine which branch of the vestibular nerve is involved. It is also a fast way to determine when and if function returns to the vestibular nerve. The test can be used for serial testing, for example, for monitoring genomycin therapy for Meniere's disease or for monitoring vestibular toxicity in patients who are receiving chemotherapy or in patients who are receiving certain types of antibiotics. VHIT can be used in place of rotation testing in patients with bilateral caloric weakness. 
It is not as much of a gold standard as the rotation chair, but it's much cheaper and faster. Similarly, VHIT can also be modified for testing children, for example, before cochlear implantations. The bottom line is that the VHIT is a cost-effective method and it reduces the need for other tests. Another application of VHIT is in differentiating between vestibular disorders and stroke in acute vertigo, especially in the emergency room settings. This follows the acronym HINTS, where HI stands for head impulse. If the head impulse results are abnormal, it usually means a peripheral vestibular disorder. But if the results are normal, it adds about 60% to the chance that the cause is a stroke. N stands for nystagmus. When it's unidirectional, it's consistent with peripheral vestibular disorders. But if it changes direction in different gaze positions, the likelihood of a stroke increases by another 30% or so. TS stands for the test of skew. If we see a vertical shift in the gaze direction when covering and uncovering the eye, that means skew deviation. Skew devi deviation adds another 9 to 10% to the chance of stroke. Overall, HINTS has a 99% sensitivity and 97% specificity for differentiating peripheral vestibular disorders from stroke in acute vertigo. Compare that with MRI, where the sensitivity in the first 48 hours after a stroke is around 95%. That's because 10 to 15% of the patients with posterior circulation stroke will have a normal MRI within the first 48 hours. CT scans have a much lower sensitivity. Anytime we have a new test of vestibular function, there's always an attempt to compare it with the caloric test. That's because rightfully or not so rightfully, the caloric test is still considered the gold standard for evaluating the vestibular function. But let's remember that these different tests of vestibular function cover different frequency ranges of the vestibular system. The caloric test covers the very low frequency range and VHIT covers the high frequency range. If one was doing a hearing test, we don't expect the results at low and high frequencies to be identical. We shouldn't expect that here either. We should consider the test results complementary, just like as we do in the hearing test. One additional point here is that the abnormalities in the auditory system typically start at high frequencies and extend to lower frequencies as the damage becomes more severe. For vestibular abnormalities, the effect usually start at uh, low frequencies and extends to high frequencies for more severe abnormalities. That's why it's possible to have normal VHIT but abnormal caloric findings. Based on what I mentioned, we should not try to compare the caloric weakness with the VOR gains in VHIT. But this is done routinely in the literature. So even though it's not a real good idea, let's see if there's a correspondence between the two. Last year, I published a paper that showed how one can determine the total vestibular function in VHIT. That can be accomplished by finding the total right and left VOR gains. So if we look at this example, the right VOR gain is 0.42 and the left VOR gain is 0.87. So sum, the sum of these two will give you 1.29 or 129%, which tells us how much total function is remaining in this patient. If we subtract this from 200, that will give us the total loss of function. For this case, that will be 71%.
this loss can be all in one ear, which is typically the case, or it could be a combination of loss from different sides. For the caloric test, we always assume the loss is unilateral. If that's the case, if one divides the total loss by the total function, then you will get the equivalent unilateral weakness in the caloric test. In this case, that will be 0.71 divided what by 1.29, which is equivalent of 55% unilateral caloric weakness. So for example, in this patient, if the loss in both caloric frequencies and the V-hit were similar, for this V-hit results, one would expect that the caloric weakness would be 55%. And in this case, it's going to be on the right side. This calculation also supports what I said earlier, that if the total right-left VOR gains is less than 1, then one must have loss in both ears. Not necessarily symmetrical, but some form of a, uh, loss in both ears. To summarize the correspondence between the V-hit and the caloric test, the general rule is that if we hit this clearly abnormal, it's very unlikely that the caloric test will be normal. So if the lateral V hit is abnormal, you can skip the caloric test or at least do a reduced test like monothermal caloric test. There has been reports of patients with normal lateral V hit who have had abnormal caloric results. In fact, some studies have suggested that V hit results are often normal if the unilateral caloric weakness is less than 40%. In the previous slide, I pointed out that one has to compare the total VOR gain with the unilateral caloric weakness and not just the VOR gain for the side of lesion. Based on the calculations from the previous slide, we can determine that for a unilateral caloric weakness of about 25%, which is considered the normal limit, the sum of the VOR gains for right and left will be approximately 1.6, or that's the average of 0 0.8, 0 0.8 for each side, which is the normal limit which you usually consider for the, uh, for the V hit. There are also studies of patients with Meniere's disease who have normal V-hit and abnormal caloric tests. This has been attributed to either the difference in the operational frequency range or due to the Whirlpool effect of the caloric irrigation in these patients. But it's also worth mentioning that more recent studies uh, show that if one incorporates catch-up saccades in the interpretation, and not just rely on the VOR gains, the incidence of VHIT abnormalities in Meniere's patients go up. It is clear that VHIT should not be considered a re replacement for the caloric test. The results from the two tests should be considered complementary and covering different frequency ranges of the vestibular system. As was mentioned, by performing VHIT first, one can complete the caloric test with fewer irrigations and avoid unnecessary repetition of irrigations when results are questionable. In summary, VHIT is an excellent first test that, that can be done quickly. Uh, when it's clearly abnormal, VHIT will reduce the need for tests such as the caloric test that takes much longer and can be unpleasant. VHIT can uniquely detect abnormalities in the vertical canals. No other test can do that. Again, let's recall that normal results do not necessarily rule out vestibular abnormalities. VHIT is subject to some artifacts that can complicate interpretation of the results. So if you are getting uh, very interesting or unexpected results, View them with skepticism until you can fully explain those results based on pathophysiology.
One important point is that artifacts do not seem to affect presence or absence of catch-up saccades, which should be the focus of interpretation instead of the VOR game. Thank you very much for your attention.